A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. I think that lawyer-lawyer divorces have a tendency to be uglier than average. There's this old joke. What do two lawyers say when they get married? It's not I do. It's I accept the terms and conditions. You have people who have an understanding of the legal system, have an understanding of their legal rights and remedies, and they will sometimes get more involved in the proceedings than a typical uh, client. Uh, This is why doctors often say, oh, it's terrible to have a doctor as a patient. I think many divorce lawyers would tell you, oh, it's terrible to have a lawyer as a client. Exhibit A, Wendy Adelson and Dan Markell. And Wendy and Dan weren't just any lawyers. They'd gone to some of the best schools in the country. They were smart. They were wealthy. When people like that don't get what they want, well, as Dan's friend David Lapp points out, things can get ugly. In their divorce, there was a lot of motion practice, which you could view as the trench warfare of divorce court. Still, it wasn't all bomb throwing. Not all the time. Even as they battled over the terms of their split, Dan and Wendy tried to move on with their lives as best they could. And that meant they both started dating other people. Is this on the record as I give it? Yes, it's on the record. Jeff Lacoste is a social work professor at FSU. He met Wendy through a mutual friend. He's got messy brown hair and glasses, more surfer dude than professor. Still, you wouldn't be wrong to point out that Jeff bears more than a passing physical resemblance to Dan Markell. Lacasse later walks Tallahassee police detectives through his relationship with Wendy. They had fun together, he explains. But he also heard a lot about the divorce. Two conversations that we had every single day for nine months were, Danny is an evil monster. Tallahassee is the worst place in the world to live, and I can't believe I got stuck here because of Danny Markell. Lacasse would read some of the motions Dan was filing against her. It's the rankings of a lunatic, basically. But every time she got one of these, she would melt down for like two weeks. Lacasse really wanted her to move on. You care about her a lot? Oh, yeah. Love with that girl. I mean, I don't think there's anyone that spent more time with Wendy in the last nine months than me. But there's something else. Something Lacasse wants to get off his chest. Third thing, some family members. Something about Wendy's relationship with her parents, and her brother. They're pretty protective of her. Want her to live in South Florida. That I'm not talking about without some assurances because there's some creepy stuff there. There's some creepy stuff there, he says. From Wondery, I'm Matthew Scher, and this is over my dead body. Baby, I'm guilty. I've got his blood on my hand. Baby, you're crazy. I never touch that man. The first season is called Tally, and this is episode two, The Former Wife. After the Pearl Harbor moment, Wendy Adelson hoped to move with the kids to Coral Springs, about an hour from Miami, which is six hours from Tallahassee. She wanted to move there permanently. In Coral Springs, the boys could be closer to their maternal grandparents. They'd have what Wendy described in her divorce petition as a better quality of life and more stability. She'd even lined up a job at a local law firm, except nothing went the way she planned. Dan wasn't about to let his kids move away, not without a fight. 10 months after Wendy first walked out on Dan, they agreed to a marriage settlement agreement. Dan would keep the house. Wendy would get $120,000 in a lump sum, plus child support just shy of $850 a month. The settlement gave Dan and Wendy 50-50 shared custody of the kids. Any disputes would be resolved by a parenting coordinator appointed by the court. But Wendy didn't get the thing she wanted most of all, to move out of Tallahassee for good. The judge refused that request. Wendy, in the court's opinion, had not proven relocation was in the best interest of the kids. 
So Wendy would have to stay near the kid's father in Tallahassee until their youngest son, who was then only two, turned 18. That's 16 years in this place she'd been desperately trying to leave. Wendy, understandably, did not take this news well. Nor did the rest of her family. See, one thing Dan may not have fully realized when he married Wendy is, when you marry an Adelson, you're marrying all the Adelsons. Together, Wendy's family ran a lucrative business in the Miami area, a dental practice. There was her mom, Donna, and her dad, Harvey. What I enjoy most about our practice is restoring a person's smile. That often changes their personality and gives them a more positive outlook on life. My dad was uh, very, very proud of being a dentist. Wendy's oldest brother, Rob, remembers his childhood as solidly middle class. We had a station wagon as our main car for much of the 80s. I think the station wagon, the Chevrolet station wagon, the blue uh, fake wood panel station wagon is much more accurate depiction of my memory of our childhood financial situation, which was great and comfortable, but not extravagant in any way. But things went well for Harvey, and his practice grew. You know, it's funny, my dad always wanted to have, I believe it was a uh, Mercedes, and I remember him at some point when I was very young buying this Mercedes, and we actually drove around the neighborhood to show off this Mercedes. And then things got even better. Somewhere around age 14 or 15, they, they put a tennis court in the backyard. My, my wife likes to remind me that I was deprived because they only had a tennis court for uh, the end of my teenage years. In total, there were three Adelson kids, Rob, his younger brother, Charlie, and Wendy, the baby of the family. Charlie, in his 20s, decided to follow in his dad's footsteps. He's a periodontist and has a very successful practice doing uh, implants and extractions. In fact, Charlie was so successful, he was eventually able to buy the family practice from his dad. And my dad would always joke that uh, he has a very understanding boss, it's his son. Donna Adelson had worked for a while as a teacher. But once the kids came along, she'd given up her job to stay at home. My mom certainly did everything she possibly could, perhaps to a fault to make things as perfect as possible for her children. Jeremy Cohen, the friend and neighbor of Wendy and Dan's in Tallahassee, remembers that the Adelsons frequently drove up to see their daughter. And they'd come driving in their big old Lexus, and, and when their Lexus was parked on the street, it was like, oh, you know, Donna Harvey here. After the divorce, the Adelsons were making that six-hour drive every week to help Wendy watch the boys on her days. Wendy would contest in a court filing that when they were married, she'd been the one stuck at home with the kids. Her, not Dan. Although the wife acknowledges the great love that both parties have for the children, she submits that she has been the primary parent of the boys up until the date of filing the petition for dissolution of marriage. The husband has traveled a great deal during the course of the marriage, attending conferences and giving lectures. Much of the parenting prior to the petition was the primary responsibility of the wife. Wendy's long-held resentments against Dan were becoming her legal ammunition. Dan argued in court that Wendy was breaking the agreement because the kids never called him when they were with Wendy. And Wendy rarely picked up her phone when Dan tried calling. In Wendy's view, Dan was the one breaking the agreement by not paying a lot of the money he was obligated to pay her. Dan should either pay or be held in contempt of court, Wendy told the judge. Things only got worse. Over the Christmas holiday in 2013, Wendy took the kids to Miami for almost three weeks. Of the 19 days the boys were gone, Dan complained, they called him on just seven. It was perverse, he'd later write in a court motion. Dan was saying outright that Wendy had violated that marriage settlement agreement. It's not just, oh, your divorce has been resolved with a settlement, uh, and uh, that's it. That's attorney David Latt, Dan's old Harvard buddy. It's an ongoing thing, which is why it can be really unfortunate, because you have these two people who decided to part ways, but if there's continuing dispute over the terms of their settlement, they're basically locked in combat with each other for months or even years after their divorce was supposedly finalized. Dan, being Dan, was also handling much of the legal work himself, according to his friend, Fernando Tisson. Of course, he hired a divorce attorney, but like two minutes into the relationship, he decided that the divorce attorney didn't know anything. So he wrote everything. He kept the lawyer, but he wrote his own briefs. 
you know, which I thought they, that was a bad idea. Dan, in one motion, made his fury clear. The former wife took a simple divorce and made it complicated, nefarious, and expensive. He was writing his own divorce motions and keeping up his teaching workload. It was a chaotic time, but Dan felt like it was worth the fight, if it meant keeping his kids close. On Valentine's Day of 2014, Dan filed a motion alleging that Wendy had given false testimony to the judge in the divorce about how much money she actually had in the bank. He claimed Wendy was hiding thousands of dollars in assets. If she wanted to leave the marriage because she fell out of love, that's one thing. But she could have done so without also taking more than the necessities so that a proper and fair distribution could have immediately followed. Wendy had unclean hands, Dan said. And that phrasing wasn't accidental. Unclean hands is a legal term, an allegation that one party or another, in this case Wendy, was acting unethically. There were motions and responses and new motions and counter motions. It was a very messy and uh, convoluted uh, docket. You don't need to be a divorce lawyer to just glance at that docket and realize that this was a very bitter battle. Wendy quickly disputed Dan's claims, adding a few barbs of her own. The former husband's pleadings only prove that he is a disgruntled former husband who cannot move past this dissolution and continues to dredge up his emotions regarding this divorce rather than address his non-compliance with the marital settlement agreement. Dan's motions, Wendy argued, were merely to embarrass, harass, and annoy the former wife. It was during this heated back and forth that Wendy was first introduced to Jeff Lacasse. Came back from Christmas break, had a conversation, decided to date more seriously. And by March 1, we're, we're, a, we're a couple, we're girlfriend, boyfriend. That's Lacasse in his initial interview with the police. By March of 2014? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And anyway, February, around, the, around Valentine's Day, I hit her with the romance and all that, and we clicked together. I spent a lot of time with Wendy. I don't think anybody's been with Wendy more than me in the last six months. Okay. She has two kids. I've been over there, I'd say, 80 or 90% of nights I'm over there. And every single night that she doesn't have the kids, with maybe just one or two exceptions, if she's in town, I've slept over. Lacasse got along well with Wendy's boys. He went to their school events, their swim practices. But Dan... Yeah, no love lost there. I probably said a hundred times in public that I like to kick his ass because he kept like, <laughs> really making Wendy suffer and things like that. Dan kept up his legal attacks on Wendy with his most serious accusation yet, that his ex-wife had lied so much that she should not only be held in contempt of court, but she should be sanctioned by the judge. That kind of thing, it's a stain on the record of any attorney, a demerit, a black mark. If Wendy's leaving Dan with the kids in the first place was Pearl Harbor, then this, this was, well... Dropping the A-bomb on the other side, because most of the time, lawyers will fight, but they kind of think that everyone is at least fighting cleanly or fairly. That's most of the time. When you see a motion for sanctions, that's one side essentially calling out the other side, saying, you guys are playing dirty, you guys are playing unfair, the judge needs to come down on you hard. And Dan wasn't done. Soon he'd reached beyond Wendy's actions and directly called out her family. In a motion filed in March of 2014, he claimed Donna Adelson was attempting to turn his kids against him. Grandma says you're stupid, Dan said his sons told him. Grandma says she hates you because you are trying to take her sunshines away from her. He thought that that was wrong. So Dan asked the court to prohibit Donna from having unsupervised time with her grandchildren uh, and to oppose some limits uh, to prevent the kids from hearing negative or disparaging things uh, about their dad. Wendy would later insist her parents had never said a bad word about Dan in front of the kids. Her family was getting tired of Dan's legal attacks. He's depoing Wendy to death. That's a phrase they used more than once. 
Meanwhile, Dan was telling friends, like his old friend Zach Schreier, that he was getting the best of the Adelsons in court. He mentioned to me that they were, you know, trying to have him declared as an unfit parent, and, you know, he had parried that blow legally, and um, he, you know, he had a sense of confidence about him that he was going to win these encounters. Jeff Lacasse, Wendy's boyfriend, saw how effective the strategy was. He was constantly you know, manipulating the legal system to keep her in stress, and it was punishing her a very effective way. And also, Wendy didn't want to be in Tallahassee. I mean, she wanted to live in South Florida. Oh, really? Absolutely. I was probably the only thing in Tallahassee. If we were doing well, she's like, yeah, I'll stay here in Tallahassee for you, and because I have to, because Mark has got this uh, big custody. Right, she, he, she can't leave. She can't leave, yeah. she can't, she can't leave with the kid. By now, Donna and Harvey were so upset about the whole situation that they allegedly told Wendy she should offer Dan a million dollars to let her move with the kids closer to them. Around that time, Jeff Lacasse was out in Tallahassee when he spotted Wendy at a local cafe with another guy. We were walking to Allstate's one day, they were having coffee. She would say it was a platonic, and I, and I said, well, I don't appreciate not knowing about this, so it became a whole thing. I got real, I lost all the trust. I was like, this is screwed up, you know? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and she was real weird about it, like, Wendy's not the best liar ever. I mean, she, she just gets so anxious that, like, it was a thing. I told her not to see this guy again. I said, you want to talk about it? That's fine. I just don't want to see him ever again. Did you confront him then? I didn't. I uh, started walking towards him and temper started firing. I thought, I do not need to end up getting arrested for assault on all state coffee. So I just went into the bathroom. The way LaCasse tells it, his suspicions grew. He started combing through Wendy's calendars for evidence that she was cheating. They fought. Wendy took off and spent two weeks in South Florida with her parents. When she came back, they made up, attended an awkward yoga class. Really awkward. Most awkward yoga session ever had. And uh, we walked to the car, and uh, I said, I love you, Wendy. She goes, I know, I need some time. I said, okay. And then, abruptly. I get an email with a no contact order two hours later. I think, she, or I think her therapist suggested she do this. My suspicion is that when you told her one side of the story and I was cast as the abusive male, because Danny was not good to her and she's on the lookout for an abusive male, because Danny was emotionally abusive. I get this email saying, don't contact me for seven days, and then I'll get in touch. That was Tuesday, July 15th, 2014. A few days before, Dan had gotten in touch with his friends Tracy and Jeremy Cohen. He was saying, hey, are you guys around this weekend? We'd love to, love to get together. I've got the boys. And Jeremy responded saying that he was going to be out of town, but I, was, I would be in town. Danny reached out to me several times that weekend. I was busy. It was just a busy weekend for me. And then on Sunday, I had not returned his phone calls yet. And he, he shows up in my driveway and says, hey, we're going to the pool. You're coming to the pool. And so I was like, OK. They hung out for a while, Dan and Tracy and their kids. And they spent some time chatting about Dan's new girlfriend. That's right. Dan had also started dating again. I mean, I think his mindset shifted from, you know, being completely head over heels in love with Wendy to, okay, she is, you know, my opponent in this case. And that switch flipped off for him. And I think then his mind was open to uh, dating again. Mm -hmm. So he, there were stories of him going off to some legal conferences and um, finding some dates there, having some success on the, uh, the single scene. And then um, he met Amy. Dan wasn't exactly someone who took things slow when it came to romance. And it was no different with Amy. We're going to leave out her last name here. He leapt in, head first. Amy lived in New York, and Dan found himself spending more time up north, doing long distance with Amy in the same way he'd once done with Wendy. That day at the pool with Tracy and the kids, he was talking about how wild he was about his new girlfriend. We talked about you know, what was going on in his life. We talked about what was going on in mine. He was the happiest he'd been in years. The following Friday, July 18th, a neighbor on Trescott Drive sees something strange out his window. He calls 911. Okay, tell me exactly what happened. The garage door on one of the other houses is open. I thought the gentleman was backing out, and I went back to my house, but he never backed out, and I came back over. And his, wind, his, his uh, driver's side uh, window is shattered, and he's battered and can't answer. He's inside. On that Friday, when um, 
when the news broke about the shooting in the neighborhood, I got a text from my sister who said that there was a shooting on Trescott. And so I started to look it up and um, I, had a, I just had a weird feeling. I then called Tallahassee Memorial Hospital and asked if Daniel Markell was there and they said yes. We were on vacation in, with my family in Rome and we were at the hotel and my wife was checking uh, her emails and she suddenly gasped and showed me the email. We got the call and just knew not much but that he'd been shot. Dan's friend and law school colleague Mark Spotswood rushes to the hospital. It got to a point where they knew he wasn't getting better and the, the hospital staff shifted to kind of trying to set up a phone tree to let people know, you know, this is what's happened and if you want to see him before he's dead, you need to come. So I saw that and I just started crying. I wouldn't just left the hotel, I had to go. I remember I left the hotel and went to a bar just to be alone where a bunch of Italians wanted to talk to me about soccer and I didn't want to talk about soccer. I started to get texts, I think, from mutual friends saying, have you heard what happened to Dan? And I said no. Uh, and then details over the next few hours started to trickle out. Abigail and I keep Shabbat, so for 25 hours, we don't use the internet or any electronic media of any kind. And then Saturday night, we're allowed to again after nightfall. So on Saturday night, we were about to go out on a date, turned on, you know, uh, her computer to like look up a movie time or something like that. And we saw on Facebook, the law student who might have been mentored by him at, at some point, posting that she was shocked to have just heard that um, Dan Markell had died. Not long after dawn, less than 24 hours after he'd been shot, Dan Markell died in the hospital. I remember I got this text and I started to feel dizzy. I started to feel kind of ill, woozy. I think I was reeling a bit. I mean, it just, it was, it, it's just like a, like a, like a kick in the stomach. I mean, like what, uh, uh, shock and horror, you know? The really shocking upshot was that Dan had been murdered. Wendy Adelson was busy the morning of July 18th. Her brother, Charlie, had bought her a new TV set, and it wasn't working. But it was still under warranty, so someone was coming to fix it. The repairman showed up a little before 9 and left around 10. Soon after that, Wendy called Charlie. A few calls followed, a couple to friends. She also called Dan, who had the kids that day. They had some coordinating to do. But Dan wasn't answering. Around 12.30, she left to go to the liquor store to pick up some bourbon for a party she was planning to go to that night. On her way, she passed her old street, Trescott, but it was blocked off. She saw a police car. She said she didn't think anything of it. She figured that maybe a tree had knocked down a power line. At one, she had lunch with some friends, a lunch she spent partly complaining about Dan. Wendy got a voicemail from her old real estate agent about something happening on Trescott, but she didn't listen to it. Around 2 p.m., an officer showed up at the restaurant and brought Wendy to the police station to tell her what had happened. It's not until 2.47 p.m. at the police station, as she's waiting for the officer to tell her what's going on, that she finally hears the message. I just listened to my voicemail. What'd you hear? Um... Wendy's dressed in a blue t-shirt and jean shorts. Her hair is pulled back with sunglasses perched on top of her head. Do you want to just hit play again for me? Sure. Hey, it's Lisa Curie. It is Friday, and I, I feel like an idiot doing this, but I just heard that there was a shooting around Trescott, and I, I promise I'm not trying to be dramatic or even nosy. I just, I don't know, just, just checking on you, my friend. Um, I hope all is well. I hope your sweet boys are well. And if there's uh, anything you need, let me know. It just it just ran a chill down my spine when I heard that there was um, something going on on Trescott. That's all right. You can stop it. First, it stop automatically. It's done. Okay. Do you have your identification with you? I'm so 
So you never took uh, the last name of Markle? No. A D E. As the investigator writes out her name, Wendy begins to shake her head. Her eyes widen. Her breathing noticeably quickens. Uh, there was a shooting at uh, your home or your your ex-husband's home at 2116 Trescott. Okay. Um, your husband, your ex-husband, excuse me, Daniel, all right, has been taken to the hospital. He's not going to survive. Oh, my God. Okay. get into everything I have to establish where you were and who you were with and so forth okay, okay? and then once we've established all that I can give you more details okay. do you understand why I wanted you to come here before I discuss this oh my God. <laughs> Wendy puts her head in her hands and sobs uncontrollably for almost a full minute I'm sorry it's okay no you have nothing to be sorry about A few days later, a memorial service for Dan Markell was held at a local synagogue. Dan's parents were there. His only sister, Shelley, spoke at the service. Wendy stood with her parents. They were flanked by off-duty Tallahassee cops Donna and Harvey had hired to be their security. They were there as well, kind of helping to corral the kids. Wendy obviously was there and uh, very emotional. And um, Did you talk to her at the service? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did. We did. We talked about, um, so she said, you know, I'm, we have tears streaming down, you know, that she's a single mom now to these boys and that she needs the boys, you know, for the sake of the boys, we need to kind of get together and, you know, help be that support network for them. They don't have a father now and they need to um, be around, uh, you know, other fathers and parents and other kids right now. And so it was kind of an olive branch, I guess. We'd been on Team Danny at that point and that was Wendy reaching across and saying, hey, let's all kind of pull back together here. Wendy left town the next day, and Jeremy says, she's never been back. There was just a lot of shock and trying to process and figure out how this could have happened. And again, it was, you know, no one had any, it just was a complete bolt out of the blue. Um, he wasn't the sort of person you thought of as having enemies who would do him physical harm. He was a very gentle person, you know, he, it just, it was as shocking as you can imagine anything being. It's not only the issue of a loss of a child, which is horrendous, but murder is unthinkable. Murder is not part of the vocabulary that I would normally be involved in. It was up to Dan's parents and his sister to arrange for his body to be brought back to Toronto. You're not dealing with a natural death. This is not an illness. This is not an accident. Um, this is nothing which has any kind of a normal uh, grief period. And I think that that even makes it more complex. I'm not good at a lot of things, but I am good at sort of reaching through the truth. Dan's old friend Abigail Schreier read all the obituaries and felt they were missing something. This isn't Dan. They're not getting him. Yes, he was a brilliant law professor. Yes, he was, you know, Harvard trained and all these things, but they're not like getting him. And I just sat down and I just said, I, I have to write about him. Like, I want to tell people who he really was. And so she began to write. So I started with, I, I think something like Dan was abrasive, which he was. In, in a wonderful way. Um, he got right in your face as a friend, as in, in every sort of way, but not aggressively. It wasn't ever aggressive, but it was just, you know, hi, who are you? Tell me everything. I'll, I'll tell you who I am. Let's get to know each other right away. And I just thought, somebody needs to say who Dan was for his children. David Latt also started to write about his friend. I've spent 
countless hours uh, following this case and writing about this case and thinking about this case over the years. His blog posts about what happened to Dan get a lot of attention. It's this kind of murder. Uh, it's just such a such a shocking thing. Uh, I think anyone, even someone not tied to Dan, would be at least curious about it because we are so curious about terrible, terrible crimes and how people can do them. Back in Tallahassee, police were talking to Dan's neighbors and friends, including the Coens. We had a detective that, that came in around this table on, I think it was Saturday, and talked through, uh, you know, asking us a lot of questions, and we gave her some theories, and uh, I know we were asking him about, you know, so what's the next steps? where do you guys go? And he couldn't really share anything. I think we were all just in this information gathering stage about kind of what are you guys doing to help solve this thing or you know, trying to find some answers. The police were asking the kind of questions police ask. Did Dan have enemies? Who'd want to hurt him? Tracy and Jeremy had a theory. We could only think of one group of people who might want Danny dead. And Wendy told police she had some theories of her own. Danny didn't treat me very well. And I'm so scared that maybe someone did this. Not because they hate Danny, but because they thought this was good somehow. Oh, are you saying that you think maybe one of your friends would have done something like this? That's next time on Over My Dead Body. Lie to my heart. Lie to my heart. I lie to my heart. You're in love with me. From Wondery, this is part two of six of Over My Dead Body a story about marriage, breakups, and everything that comes after. Over My Dead Body was written and reported by me, Matthew Scher, and Eric Benson. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Associate producer is Chris Siegel. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondering. Wondering.